morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you that know me, uh, I'm Tarek Mian. I'm the uh, director of the archaeology division uh, within Tarragate Insurance, and I have been working in the insurance sector and insuring archaeologists for over 22 years now. So I've been asked by various people over a period of time to put together some sort of risk management presentation. Um, some of you may know some of this. Uh, some of you may have uh, been in one of my presentations before. But uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it and we'll do questions at the end. So not willing to, not wanting to teach anyone to suck eggs. We're just going to go through the very basics of risk management and talk you through the process and the flow. So first of all, when we're looking at risks, we have to identify what sort of risk is it? And then is it physical, legal? There's all sorts of different types of risks. Once we've identified the risk, we then analyze it to see what its impact is going to be on various people that we have to be uh, aware of. So for example, the impact on you, employees, anyone really. After we've analyzed it, we then evaluate the risk. I mean, what's it gonna do? The severity, the likelihood, the consequences. These are all very important stages of risk management. We then decide whether we're going to accept the risk or reject the risk. If we reject it, that's fine. We think that the risk is too high. We don't really want to take those types of risks. So then we forget about it. If we accept the risk, then we have to decide what we're going to do with it. We can, can we accept it in its current state? Probably not. So we want to actually try and improve the risk and therefore we treat it. We either manage it and eliminate it completely or we keep it but we reduce it by making sure that it's managed and carefully controlled, or we transfer the risk. Someone lets somebody else take that risk, and that's where insurance comes in. And then, most importantly, we have to monitor and review. Has the risk changed? Now, this is actually um, the point where I give you a little example. So for example, let's just say you want to go and get some lunch from the shop, but you look outside and it's raining. So you've identified the risk. You know that it's a physical risk. You know you're gonna get wet if you go outside. And you don't really want to get wet because you might catch cold, ruin your jacket, ruin your shoes, obviously depending on what you're wearing. Um, and then you decide, actually, I don't wanna go out. You reject the risk, let's forget it. I'm just not gonna bother with lunch. Or you accept it, okay, I am going to go to the shop and get myself a sandwich, and then you decide to treat it. What am I gonna do? Manage it, put on a jacket, put a hoodie, take an umbrella, retain, reduce, same sort of difference, or transfer, get your mate to go and get your lunch for you. It's great, isn't it? That just gives you a flavor of how you think about risk management and the actual sort of thought process behind it. So this is the, uh, leads us on nicely to the next point. Why the risks should indeed be managed. And there are many advantages and disadvantages, and I'm just going to put a few here up on the screen for you all so you can see advantages of risk management. Well, it's all about your reputation, your cash flow control, your relationships with your clients, your employees, your suppliers, your financial security, your job security, and of course, reduced insurance claims and premiums. And it really does make a big difference if you do actually manage your risks better. We're going to move on now and just talk a little bit about managers, duties and responsibilities. Now, I do like this next slide because um, it will usually get a few chuckles. Yes, being a site manager is easy. What do you need to be the responsible person? Who do you have to look after? Site security is very important. At this point, a lot of people will ask me about why do I need to look after contractors? Well, you still have a duty of care towards your subcontractors and volunteers come exactly the same rights. Volunteers come with exactly the same rights as employees. You'll obviously do your method statements, you'll do your risk assessments, you'll make sure that everyone has their personal protective equipment and you'll make sure they wear it. <laughs> need to be aware of all your site hazards. Um, asbestos is a very important one to be aware of. Make sure everyone has asbestos recognition training if they're going onto a brownfield site. Um, responding to issues, being aware of what your duties are, being aware of what you need to do, being aware 
of where the next stage is. So if something does go wrong, what do you need to do at that stage? Have a process, have it written down. If there's an insurance claim, if you have a problem, if something goes wrong, who do you report it to? What information do you need to collect? If you're pre-prepared, then when something does happen, you'll be very cool about it. Make sure you delegate responsibilities. This is very important. A lot of site managers feel like everything is on their shoulders. But if you delegate some of the responsibilities to other people, you're making life a bit easier for yourself. You're bringing them along as well. It's really good. Credit checks is something that not many people um, always think about, but it's something that's always done in the background to make sure your clients can actually afford to pay their bills. Subcontractor management is fairly important, making sure that subcontractors have their own insurance and that they're not um, breaching the uh, health and safety and risk assessment at work, risks and rules and everything else. Really, really important part of it. OK, we're going to move on and understand about what is and isn't insured within the various principles of insurance. So this is where we talk about, is it your first port of call? Is it your safety net? Well, it's a bit of both. It really depends. Insurance is a risk transfer mechanism where we saw in the earlier screen where we talk about how you uh, eliminate, manage and treat various risks. Insurance is that part where you transfer the risk away. And this is where I tell you that actually insurance only forms between 20 and 25 percent of your actual risk management program, because a lot of risks you can't insure. We talk about contractual liability very quickly. So contractual liability just makes you responsible for things that you wouldn't be if you didn't sign the contract wording. So it's very, very important to check your contract wordings. And if you get anything in your contracts that say you're responsible for stuff that you wouldn't be if you didn't sign the contract, think about it. Do you really need to sign that contract? Feel free to give me a call and run past me to see whether or not there's anything that I can help you with or advise you on, because I've seen a lot of different contracts. And more often than not, it's the same clauses that catch people out. Legal jurisdiction, very important. To which courts do the rules apply? So you sign a contract that has a UK jurisdiction clause in there that says the law of England and Wales, for example, applies to this contract. That's great. That makes it easy. But if your client is an international client and the jurisdiction is a US court, your defense costs will be horrendous. So just make sure that you always check that. Read your terms of, uh, of business and your conditions of trading. Make sure that you don't sign your life away with anything. Um, this is where we talk about um, other types of things that, for example, aren't insurable, such as criminal acts. You know, can't normally insure against criminal acts. Um, you can if someone does it against you, but not if you do it. This is a very good way of looking at how insurance is broken down. Your liabilities, your assets, your cash flow, your people, and your reputation. That's a really good way of looking at what the different sort of pillars of insurance fall into. So liability picks up things like public liability, employer's liability, products liability, professional indemnity, assets. Well, that's what you own. That's your hired implant. That's your own plan. That's your equipment, your geophysical survey gear, your laptops, your cameras, everything else that goes along with it. Your cash flow. That's making sure that you've got business interruption in place, making sure that you've got um, your bills paid in time and everything else. Your people, obviously your staff, personal accident insurance, uh, medical insurance, employer's liability again covers on that side as well. And then finally your reputational liability, which is picked up by director's liability, management liability, professional indemnity, cyber liability and etc just gives you a little flavor for the different types of insurances that are available for us. So contract conditions, collateral warranties, we've touched on this slightly. We're just going to delve in a little bit more. So have a standard terms and conditions document. It's so important, especially if you're a sole trader or a, or a limited company. No matter what, if you're working within the archaeology sector as a business, you need to have your own terms and conditions standard. Get a solicitor to draft them, ideally, but you can download standard terms and conditions off the internet and create them for yourself, if nothing else. It's always better to have them than not, as if you've got no agreement with your client, you've got nothing to fall back on. Read your contract terms, read your tender conditions, because sometimes the tender uh, stage conditions tie you in 
if you proceed with the contract. So it's very important to check both of them. Novations and assignments. If you come across these terms, it's best to give me a call to chat through anything like that. Um, collateral warranties, highly unlikely you see them much in archaeology, but just to give you a very uh, brief idea of what a collateral warranty is, it's an agreement that creates uh, a relationship between you or yourselves and somebody higher up the chain in the contract uh, um, for, uh, phase. So for example, a developer hires in a builder to do some work, the builder hires the archaeologist. Now, the builder has the relationship with the archaeologist. The archaeologist does not have a relationship with the, the landowner, the main contractor, whoever the case may be. So the collateral warranty creates a relationship between the top level and between the archaeologist. And that's in the event that, for example, the builder in the middle goes bust, then the main contractor, developer, etc., has recourse to go to the archaeologist to talk about the contract and the conditions and how they applied and whether there's any issues or anything else. International contracts, if you do get an international contract, it's really best to run it by your insurers just to make sure that they uh, can check the conditions and see that your insurance would react. Certain uh, policies, especially things like professional indemnity, they don't react in certain countries. So you really need to check that and make sure that you are fully aware of that. Um, this is something that obviously is picked up by professional indemnity a, a lot of the time, but it's to do with just making sure that you've got your intellectual property rights protected um, under your publications and that you're not breaching anyone else's intellectual property rights. This is a question I get asked a lot. What's a disclaimer worth? Usually not a lot in my experience. What we normally say is that it's good to have a disclaimer because what it does is it puts people off claiming against you. But realistically, it's down to a court of law to decide whether or not the disclaimer has actually any um, legal footing. So it's worth having them, but you know, be aware they may not actually save you. Letters of reliance. Now, we see a lot of these with archaeologists. They come through on an almost weekly basis. You have to make sure that if you do get a letter of reliance and you decide that you want to sign it for economic reasons, then make sure that it doesn't increase your liability. So again, feel free to pick up the phone to run through it with your insurer, with well, with your broker, with me. Um, but ideally, insurers don't like you signing letters of reliance. And if you do have to sign them, then you know, make sure you get them checked before you sign them. Otherwise, they can increase your uh, liability at law, your contractual liability. And if you do not check your contract terms and conditions, then, well, that can happen. I do love this slide. Carillion, they went the way of the dinosaurs because they did not check their terms and conditions. And they signed up to a contract, well, a couple of contracts. I think it was the Aberdeen Bypass and Liverpool Hospital where they were tied in under their contract to how much they could charge and they overran on costs massively and couldn't charge them back to the client. And that's why, that's the main reason why. There were various other reasons, but those were the ones that actually caused them to go. It's really important, check your contract conditions. I can't stress that enough. Okay, we're gonna go on and talk about happier things now. This is always a slightly controversial slide, but it's becoming less so nowadays. <clears throat> the usable margin is so important because you just don't know what might happen. So always make sure when you're pricing your contracts that you're building in your margins, not just your profit margins, but your margins for unseen expenses, for overruns, for weather related delays, for an insurance claims excess, various things like that. It's so important, create a margin. What if you've got no business coming in for a couple of months? The current pandemic has really brought that to the front. So just make sure you've got your margins and you've got your safety net built in, so important. The um, typical margin in archeology span in the past used to be fairly slim. I think it still is for many people. And you know, that margin may sound slim, but for example, 
this unit of 5 million turnover, this is an actual live example. I'm not going to say who it was a while ago, but, you know, a unit with a 5 million turnover and a surplus of 60,000 at the end of the year, 1.2%, you can see somebody going bust owing you half of that. Well, you've got that's half your turnover you've got to do to get that, that surplus back. So really make sure that the better the margin you have, the better your safety cushion. And again, do credit checks on your clients to make sure that you know in advance if they've got county court judgments against them or if they're bad payers, you can check all those things. And then finally, credit insurance, it's useful. It basically protects your debtor's book. So in the event one of your clients goes bust owing your money, credit insurance will repay your debt to you. Just going to talk on a few insurance claims examples. These are particular to the insurance industry and um, I think give a really good snapshot of the various risks that you see within archaeology. Typically under public liability we see damage to underground services, the usual uh, cut through an underground cable that no one knew was there, fiber optic cables and they are very expensive to replace, slips and trips. We've had one recently at an archaeological site where a trip but not fall caused a hundred and ten thousand pound claim which was paid out and this was a very simple example so there was an archaeological site which was fenced off and there was a pathway around the outside so that people could come and watch and see what was going on it was a community archaeology excavation and um, this guy was a bus driver or coach driver, I should say, and he'd stopped with a coach load of people and they were all looking over the side, over the fence, having conversations with the archaeologists and they're all heading back to the coach. And the coach driver was also just about heading back and as he turned to go, he tripped over a toolbox that was sticking out three inches through the plastic tape of the fence. He staggered, he didn't fall, caught himself, went, no worries, and limping slightly, went back to the coach. No one thought anything of it because he didn't even fall, but it turns out that he'd ripped a ligament in his thigh and he was in a lot of pain while driving because of the clutch, the amount of pressure that he had to put on the clutch. And that meant that he couldn't drive as a bus driver, so he decided to sue. And he sued for a quarter of a million pounds. And after a fair amount of medical checks and negotiations, we agreed a settlement of 100,000 with him because we found he actually could drive, but only part time. And the 10,000 pounds was the defense costs that went with that. Well, 13,000 defense costs. So that was the uh, that was what a very simple trip can do in terms of insurance claims. Um, I'm not going to run through all of these just because it will take ages, but you know, asbestos under the professional indemnity. That was an interesting one where failure to recognize asbestos caused uh, a spread so basically some sheets of asbestos were picked up and put in a spoil heap and that was enough for the local contractor the main contractor to walk past see the asbestos sheets lying on the spoil heap and close the entire site down and uh, yeah the delays and everything else the archaeologists would innocently put the uh, uh, asbestos sheets onto the spoil heap not knowing they were asbestos sheets uh, were the ones who ended up being sued for the costs and delays and everything else we ended up settling it at 25,000 pounds defense costs and seven and a half thousand in compensation but it did take a bit of a while to do that hired implant this is where we see uh, the most claims and the biggest claims actually um, your hiring conditions are really important we will talk about that a little bit later but you know you can see there plant arson 178 thousand pounds very easy to happen literally um, those are the biggest claims that we see and they do tend to be more often than not. We usually get two or three a month literally in hired implant and equipment claims. Um, property damage, business interruption, so be it the usual office fires and roof damage and that sort of stuff, this happens and uh, that's the typical examples and of the sort of amounts that get claimed for. They vary depending on the values but you know those are some live examples of claims that have actually occurred. Um, accidents to staff, this happens and if you've got um, group personal accident for your staff, so these are the uh, types of claims that we've seen. There are various others but you know we've just focused on a few simple ones at the moment. 
before we go on to the hired and plant side of things, I'd like to just talk a little bit about some emerging risks and what we're seeing as changing in the insurance sector um, from for the reasons of well GDPR and for the reasons of um, coronavirus. So crime, first and third party risks. When we talk about crime, we're not talking about somebody breaking in and stealing. What we're talking about is fraud. Now, fraud claims have gone absolutely through the roof recently. First party means theft by employees, third party fraud by somebody from the outside. Now, I'm sure you've all seen the emails that come through purporting to be from a Nigerian prince who's offering you millions of dollars if you give him your bank details. Yeah, those are the easy ones to spot. The ones that aren't so easy to spot are the ones that purport to come from your boss that tell you to uh, do something for him or her. And you think, oh, actually, I'll do that. But what you don't realize is that they actually come from fraudsters. Office 365 gets hacked all the time. So make sure your pass passwords are really, really secure. Cyber liability. This relates to not just um, the risks of losing data, but also ransomware, for example. Biggest area of claims that we see is through ransomware, where they lock your database or prevent access to your website, and you have to pay them essentially a ransom to release it and they give you a code and they're gone. But if that code doesn't work, you're still stuck. Your database is still locked. So if you do get ransomware, God's sake, try not to just pay the ransom immediately. The best thing to do is to actually have some cyber insurance in place, then the insurers will do all of it for you, whether it's paying the ransom or whether it's recovering your data, your systems, helping you out with all of those things. So important to have cyber insurance nowadays. And with coronavirus, what we have seen is that because of lockdown and various things, criminals have turned their attentions online. And we are seeing far more cyber claims than we ever did. To be fair, Terragate got hacked, although it wasn't us directly that got hacked, but it was a company within our group that got uh, at the end of September. And they took down some of our servers through ransomware attacks. We didn't pay the ransom. We just took the servers offline, did the investigations, wiped and recovered from backups, but it took us three and a bit weeks to get all of that sorted, and we lost a lot of money off the back of that in terms of lost income and everything else because we had to take down some of our trading websites, and that's not recoverable. That money is gone, but that's the type of impact that a cyber attack can have on your business. And then there's also reputational damage, and if we had actually lost any client data, which thankfully we hadn't, then we would have had ICO, so Information Commissioner's Office fines to pay, investigation costs, setting up helplines, absolute nightmare. Get cyber insurance, it's so important nowadays. I'm going to touch quickly on environmental impairment liability. It's not something that we see as being a massive risk for archaeologists, and to be fair, it's more something that your contractual conditions may come across and say, well, you've got to have environmental impairment liability, and sometimes they refer to it as pollution liability. But this is more to do with landowners and less to do with contractual risks. So under your standard public liability, you've got pollution cover in the event that you cause pollution and you get sued for cleanup costs. That is covered under your normal public liability, but it is purely cleanup costs. It doesn't cover the cost of making good that the environment agency might impose on you. So for example, if you caused a diesel spill that ended up polluting a lake, which was, um, shall we say, in an environmentally sensitive area, the environment agency will say, okay, you're not only going to clean up that lake, but you're also going to go and dig another lake and restock it. Now that sort of risk is covered by environmental impairment liability, not public liability. So the cover is available, but we don't see it as being a massive risk. That particular example that I gave of a lake having to be redone actually happened to Britvik. They had a leak of tomato juice from their factory. I used thin tomato juice. It's quite, you know, environmentally friendly. Not to a lake because it will cover the lake, stop any oxygen from going in and kill all the wildlife in it. So that was what caused that particular one, just as an example. Uh, kidnap and ransom. Um, again, we're seeing more of this. Again, just because of uh, lockdown, 
people resorting to other ways to try and make some money, criminally, of course. So make sure that if you do go abroad, you've got good travel insurance that includes kidnap and ransom cover. Very important. Finally, just replying again to people who ask me about GDPR, just know your responsibilities, do your compliance, make sure you're obviously that date is now a couple of years gone by, so I'm sure everyone is up together with it. But if you're starting up a new company, again, very important, make sure you're complying with that. OK, moving on. I love this picture. There's plenty of them on the Internet. I'm sure you've seen loads where people are doing stuff that they really shouldn't be doing and they tend to make me cringe a lot. But yeah. Um, accident book review, post accident investigation, all of these things are so important. This is again to do with site managers. Just make sure that you are aware of what's happening. Consider the surrounding risks. So for example, um, let's just say you've got a brownfield site and well, what if it's by the side of a motorway? You know. So this is an example of a claim that occurred. Well, I say a claim. It wasn't. Well, it was a small claim, but it could have been so much worse. So uh, a, which was parked on a slight incline for some bizarre reason, started to roll backwards, whether the handbrake failed or whether it wasn't properly engaged. No one knows, but it rolled across the site and then crashed into a van that was parked on site, thankfully stopping its path stopping its movement. But if uh, if that van hadn't been there, then uh, that lorry would have carried on rolling, gone through a thin fence and into the M1 motorway at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. Can you imagine the disaster that would have been? 10 million pounds worth of public liability wouldn't have covered the various claims. So that would have taken out the company as well. So it's just consider the surrounding risks just look at everything and make sure that you're fully aware of all the risks, not just on your site, but around it as well. I'm going to very quickly touch on fleet risk management. Yes, driving responsibility, making sure you know what's going on. There are so many responsibilities that go with fleet risk management. If you do have a reasonable sized fleet or you're, you've got a business with a lot of temporary hires, a fleet manager is a very good idea because there is so much to do, not translation and responsibilities, but record keeping, driver induction, assessments, license checks, making sure policies and procedures are up together, make sure that scheduling, <laughs> uh, this is very important, so scheduling and joint liability is there if you make people, um, if people feel they need to speed in order to be there at a particular time, then the employer can be jointly responsible for conviction and the fines that go with it. Um, make sure you've got your accident reporting procedures up together, so important, otherwise you just don't know. You have an accident, somebody else drives off, you didn't get the third party's details correctly, takes ages. Do investigations after accidents to make sure that you know what caused it and see if you can make sure it doesn't happen again or do your best to try and make sure it doesn't happen again if there's anything that can be done to manage the risks. Again, making sure that vehicles are properly maintained and inspected and that they're fit for purpose. So important. Parking and security, very important. If vehicles are going to be kept with equipment in them overnight, they need to be kept in a secure lock compound or well, ideally they need to be kept in a garage. But best to make sure that you don't leave anything in your vehicles overnight as a lot of insurers don't cover equipment left in vehicles overnight. We are seeing uh, an increase in theft from vehicles. Again, catalytic converters being cut away, so it does seem to be on the rise again. So just be aware of that where you leave your vehicles overnight. Now we're going to go to plant hire contracts and your responsibilities within them. So plant hire, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this just because it's where we see the most claims and also where there is going to be a change going forward under the insurance rules and regulations as to what you can and can't be insured for. So have a system of checks in place, so important. And when you hire, hire from a CPA company, CPA's Construction Plant Association, the 2011 hire conditions, and there is a modified version of it, is the gold standard that insurers will judge your claims on. Now. CPA versus HAE. HAE is Hire Association Europe. Try not to hire any 
plant from companies that use higher association Europe terms and conditions. So CPA has a website, www.cpa.uk.net, I think is the website. And if you go on there, you can see and find all the plant hire companies that are CPA registered and use CPA conditions of hire. You can do it by postcode, you can do it by type of plant. So it's very easy to just go on there and get all your hire. Anybody who uses bespoke hire conditions or modified hire conditions that aren't CPA or are HAE, they can end up costing you a fortune if things go wrong. So for example, CPA allows you to deduct the cost of fair wear and tear off the settlement on damage to plant. So let's say you hire a five-year-old JCB. Under CPA, they will accept money for a second hand. Under HAE, it's new for old replacement. Now insurers are going to stop doing new for old replacement very soon. They're just going to say, nope, we're not going to do that anymore because it's open to fraud. So if you are going forward, if you hire from a company that says new for old replacement on the plant hire conditions, well, it's not going to be insurable. So for God's sake, please do check CPA conditions of hire only. And while we will allow new for old for up to three years, once a plant or item of plant or equipment goes over three years old, the insurers will not replace it on a new for all basis. So it's something to be really aware of. If you're going to borrow equipment or you're going to take it in on free loan, tell your insurers because it's not automatically, but it can be covered. You just have to make sure you tell them that you are going to do this. Site security, so important. If you've got items of plant worth a lot of money, such as over a quarter of a million pounds, you have to tell your insurers if you're going to have um, lots of items of plants so aggregation of plants. So, for example, you might have three JCBs, uh, four dumper trucks on a site that can add up to a lot of money. Check your limit of cover under your plant hire policy. As standard, we give a quarter of a million or we can extend it to half a million. But if it's more than that, we have to do a bespoke hire policy for you. So you need to make sure that you check aggregation of plant. And that's not just JCBs and dumper trucks, but also covers things like trackage, hoarding, fencing, any scaffolding if appropriate, welfare units, porter cabins, porter loos, all of that. Whole thing, you have to look at everything that you've hired on site. What's the total value to replace it? If it's a lot, pick up the phone and have a conversation with us. We will need to change your insurance to make sure that it's appropriate. And if you've got more than five items of plant on site, you will have to have 24 hour security anyway, as per the insurance requirements. Continuing hire charges, again, something that the hire contract makes you responsible for. Our policy covers it, but there's a lot of policies out there that don't cover it. So be careful what you buy. Again, liability towards plant operators. Some uh, Somebody approached me not long ago and said, uh, I just need hired in plant insurance. I don't need liability. I said, why not? He said, well, I'm only hiring plant. I don't employ anyone. It comes with its own driver. So I made him pull out his hire conditions. And when he read it, he realized that he had public liability responsibility and employer's liability responsibility under the hire conditions. So when you hire, you have liability towards the operator. They essentially become your employee for the day or while they're under your supervision. And also if any damage is caused by the digger, it's your responsibility. So again, if it takes out an underground cable or an overhead cable or anything like that, you're still responsible. So just make sure that you're aware of where your uh, responsibilities lie and where they stop and where they start. Again, your higher conditions will give you all of that. The picture in question is not an example of a claim, not directly from an example of a claim, but we did have one where a digger drowned in mud. And that was while the digger was actually had been off hired and was driving off site, got stuck in the mud, tried to dig himself out and ended up being buried and drowned. And it was still the archaeologist's responsibility because the responsibility ended once the digger was on the flatbed lorry being taken back to their headquarters. Whilst it was still on the site, it was still the archaeologist's responsibility, even though it had been off hired and the driver was dry. still. So again, that all that's all to do with the conditions of hire. Check them. And that again comes towards when this liability finish. It starts and finishes 
at certain times according to the higher conditions. Usually also under CPA conditions of hire, you're responsible for up to seven days after you've given the off hire instruction. So if you decide, for example, on a Friday afternoon, you don't need the plant again, and you decide to off hire it, you contact the plant company and say, come and collect your digger, we don't need it anymore. But then they don't come and pick it up until say Wednesday next week because they don't have availability. You're still responsible for it, even though you've vacated the site and you've off hired the plant. Seven days that responsibility continues, so just be aware of that. Again, talking about site responsibility, define the boundaries of your site. So important to make sure you know where your responsibilities start and finish. And I believe that's it. We're now at the end of our presentation. So thank you very much for listening to me for so long. And uh, I'll now take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you.